This is our last lecture video for Chapter 10, though we have plenty of uh, example videos that have come before this one and are part of this uh, set of slides. And our goal for this particular video is to talk about how the ideas of energy and momentum are still applicable in problems where there is rotation. So we're going to start out with energy, uh, so basically revisiting Chapter 7 in the context of rotation. And if we think about Chapter 7, the idea of work was force in the direction of motion times distance. For Chapter 10, we have that same general idea, rotational force times rotational distance. So although we could go through a short derivation that would involve basically multiplying by radius and dividing by radius, respectively, um, we can just write down this idea that work when we are causing something to rotate can be written as torque, which is the rotational equivalent of force, times theta, which is the angular distance or the amount of rotation that we would have had. So we can do a quick example to make sure we understand how this would um, play out. And it will uh, involve thinking about the disk shown, although the angle that we're showing here is not uh, the angle of 90 degrees. If we're asked to push that disk um, with a 10 Newton force at the edge as drawn, then what we have here for this circle is that we have the radius, and that's the radius and distance to the axis. We have this perpendicular force. And so with these two numbers, we can get torque. So the torque is equal to the perpendicular force times the distance to the axis. This is a chapter 9 idea that we're still um, using here. The perpendicular force is 10 newtons. The distance to the axis, the radius here is 15 centimeters. We need to remember that we should turn this into meters just by default, 0.15 meters. So the torque here is 1.5 newton meters. And then the work from that previous, um, from that previous slide, we have that work in chapter 10 is the torque times the angular distance. And so in this case, we have 1.5 Newton meters. Now, theta, 90 degrees, is not the angle that we um, need to have here. So theta is 90 degrees, but we need two pi radians for every 360 degrees. That's pi over 2 radians, something like 1.5. So times pi over 2 radians. And we will get two point three six two point three six joules. OK. A note here on the units. Now, newtons times meters times radians really kind of just stays newtons times meters. But that it really is what work already is. Um, work is force in the direction of motion, newtons, times distance, meters. And so joules are functionally equivalent to newton meters. Um, but when we use the unit of joules, that's so that we understand we're talking about energy. And when we use the unit of Newton meters, it's so that we understand that we are talking about torque. So we don't really want to mix those up, even though they're functionally equivalent. So the work that we do on the disk for this introductory example here is the 2.36 joules that we calculated. OK, so if we think back to the idea of work from chapter 7, we spent this nice long amount of time in the chapter seven lectures, uh, talking about what work is, what we can do with work, setting up all of that understanding. We're not gonna repeat ourselves um, to make sure we understand what work really is and what it can do, 
we're just going to um, follow some parallels. So if we do work and we lift an object, that is still going to be perp um, that is still going to be potential energy from gravity. If we do work to move an object, that is still standard kinetic energy. But we do want to look at if we cause an object to rotate, as we follow the different masses moving around, we can actually create a more robust statement about what that kinetic energy looks like in terms of the quantities that we've been working with in this chapter. If that didn't quite make sense, let's walk through it together. So here we have a dumbbell shaped object that we've seen before, two masses on sticks. And no matter which one I push on will cause the whole thing to rotate. So if I push on mass one, it will move with a certain speed and mass two will move with a certain speed. And if we think about the fact that they both have to finish circles in the same amount of time, they will be moving at different speeds. And so all of a sudden this system has two different masses and two different velocities because of the two different distances. That seems like a lot um, and not a very generalized statement about the kinetic energy of a rotating object. If, however, we notice that if they are finishing circles in the same amount of time as each other, then their angular velocity will be the same from one object to the other. They are completing circles two pi radians worth in the same amount of time and so R1 times the, regu the um, combined omega is equal to V1, and R2 times that combined omega is equal to V2, which means we can actually replace this idea of um, V1 and V2 with R1 omega and R2 omega. When we rewrite that um, out then, what we get is one half out front because it was on both terms, and omega squared at the very end because it was on both terms. But then the stuff in the middle in the parentheses is the moment of inertia of this system. And so instead, what we can do, which is going to be a true statement for any object shape that is able to rotate, is that the kinetic energy of rotation is equal to one half i omega squared. And that fits right into our standard work and energy list. And so we can set up regular work and energy problems. We get to have problems that basically function just the same way that any of the other ones did. But now there's one extra term to consider. If we think back to the way that we did problem solving in chapter seven, we asked ourselves all these different questions. For regular kinetic energy, we asked, are we moving? For the potential energy of gravity, we asked, are we higher? For the potential energy of a spring, we asked, is there a spring? For this last question, the kinetic energy of rotation, we can just ask, are we rotating? Are we spinning? And if so, we will have this kind of energy. So a rolling object, if we imagine the way that we walk across a room, we put our foot down, and then we pick up our other foot and keep going. The reason that we can walk comfortably um, indoors and you know when it's icy in the winter time here in Michigan, we slip around, is because when we walk, our goal is that we don't want our foot to slip at all, even though we ourselves are moving forward. When we have a rolling object, that object rolls without slipping. And if it doesn't slip, it doesn't lose energy to friction, which means an object that rolls without slipping doesn't have a friction force that is taking energy away from the system. That's the key part. It's not taking energy away from the system. And so when we have an object that rolls, it is physically moving forward and it is rotating, spinning. And so we have kinetic energy of the motion forward, one half mv squared, and we have the kinetic energy of the rotation of the spinning, one half i omega squared. Both of those terms are going to come together if we have an, have an object that is rolling. It is possible to have an object that just moves. That was a lot of our chapter seven problems were objects that just moved. And it is possible to have an object that is spinning in place, like our grinding wheel problems or turntable problems, but a rolling object will have both terms.
Now, I am not going to go through this whole example um, on the whiteboard. There's other examples that we're going to do, and we don't want to overload ourselves with um, videos to watch. But if you need to check to see how this um, works, we've got this quick example, and then we're going to see it happen in fuller, um, complete energy problems. But if we're asked to find the total kinetic energy of a rolling object, we need to know what shape that object is. So the top of this, we have the kinetic energy is both terms, the moving and the spinning. Then we have to recognize that we have to be clear to ourselves whether we have a hoop or a disc or a ball because they have different moments of inertia for the same amount of mass. And if we are not slipping, then V, the forward motion, is related to the omega, the spinning motion, by V equals R omega. That idea that rolling objects have V equals R omega um, still applying is something we talked about back in chapter 6. Okay, so you can go through the full calculation and double check for yourself that you get 3.3 joules of energy. Um, but it's on the slide, and the slide you can always access in the PDF form on Blackboard as well. Okay, so a rolling object has two different types of kinetic energy, and we can just use that idea in our conservation of energy problems. Now this first one is mostly a concept. If we have an object that we have the mass and radius for, it will actually have a different speed at the bottom of the incline if it is a thin disc or a hoop or a ball. We have to be specific about what object we're looking at because the moment of inertia I is based on that object shape. One thing that if you're able to at home, what I want you to try to set up is a ramp of any kind, right? You can use a fancy whiteboard um, to roll things down, any, any board or book or anything, and then find some objects um, around your house that are spherical shaped, balls, or um, disc shaped, even, even cylinders that are kind of short, and roll them down the hill. Although objects fall at the same rate, they do not roll down hills at the same rate because there's energy that is going into spinning the object and there's energy that is going into um, moving the object forward. In the textbook, it talks about um, thin and thick uh, soup in cans. You could roll some cans down a ramp and I would love to see pictures or videos of what you put together. But do actually convince yourself that this changes based on what object we have. In class, I would show us um, a whole bunch of objects, and we don't have that set up here. I don't have that material with me. But you can do it at home and, and kind of confirm it for yourself. If we think about um, the different types of objects, the ones that have the mass more concentrated at their center, more like a um, disc than a hoop, they will be able to get to the bottom faster because there's less energy that they have to put into rotating themselves. So something to keep in mind. Okay, so this is going to be a fully worked example that we have a separate um, video for. It's going to show us that full Chapter 7 um, problem-solving process with that extra question we have to ask ourselves, are we rotating? And so we'll see how that new term fits into our problem solving uh, using the same kind of setup that we learned back in Chapter 7. This is another example where we have different questions that we say yes and no to for the disk compared to the falling mass. We saw a two-object problem. It was an Atwood machine back in Chapter 7. We're going to see what a two-object problem looks like here in Chapter 10. We go through the same exact process, we ask ourselves yes or no questions, and then we, um, we figure it out. So you'll see that example fully worked out in the slides, or in a separate lecture video, sorry, um, as well. And then just to make sure that while we're watching this lecture video, we see what that process looks like, we do have a situation here that we want to talk ourselves through those yes or no questions, just so that we know what that looks like. Okay, so for this problem, 
we want to draw the picture And we want to draw what we mean by before. And what we mean by after. It's the same overall process that we learned about back in chapter seven. Now, the key thing is that when we are asking ourselves these questions, there's just one more question to ask. So we have regular kinetic energy, we have the kinetic energy of rotation, we have the potential energy from gravity, and we have the potential energy from a spring. Okay, so in this situation, we ask ourselves, are we moving at the start of the problem? As always, we want to recognize that if we aren't asked to find that initial speed or we're not given that initial speed, then it means we aren't moving when the problem first starts. We are compressed into that spring, about to launch ourselves forward, but we don't have any initial motion. And since we aren't moving at the beginning of the problem, we are also are not rotating at the start of the problem. For gravity, we ask ourselves, are we higher than at other points in the problem? And since we're at the bottom of a hill at the beginning, the answer is no here. And then we ask ourselves, is there a spring? And absolutely there is a spring. And so 1 half kx squared. For the after situation, we ask ourselves, are we moving? Absolutely. Even in this problem with no numbers, we are asked to find the speed v of the disk at the top of the hill. So 1 half mv squared. Are we rotating at the end of the problem? Absolutely, we're rolling without slipping during that whole adventure. And so these terms kind of come as a pair. One half i omega squared, where we also have to understand what the i term is going to be, but a lot of students kind of confuse themselves and put in, um, instead of one half i omega squared, they just put in whatever i is supposed to be there. And we need to make sure that we're not just kind of going through the motions of what we kind of remember from lecture, but we actually understand what we're doing here. This is the kinetic energy term, and we have that type of energy at the end of the problem. We are higher at the end of the problem, but there is no kinetic, or there's no potential energy of a spring at the end of the problem because there's no spring there. So the last thing we ask ourselves, and it's separate from before or after, it is not in the before or after column, we ask if there is work. We're looking for a separate push or pull or friction or air resistance. And because we're rolling without slipping, we lose no energy at all to friction. So there's no work term. So we would set 1 half k x squared equal to the sum of all three of these terms added together. And so that's what that um, rest of the slide shows us, is that our energy balance equation ends up one term in our before category and three terms in our after category, where the only extra chapter 10 ideas that we need to worry about is that this is a disk, so we need to use one half mr squared instead of a hoop or a ball. And we need to recognize that v and omega are not separate unknowns, we can write one in terms of the other, and that will show up in the other examples that we do, uh, which is why we are just going through the um, setup in this particular example. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit, but still in this same lecture video. If we think about what we've covered so far in this chapter, we have revisited what the ideas of distance, speed, and acceleration look like in the context of rotation. That was the first lecture video that we had, and that was basically chapters two and three ideas um, to understand angular kinematics. We then revisited how forces can cause rotation, and so torque causes angular um, acceleration when forces cause regular acceleration. And so the second lecture video that we covered, we saw how chapters four and five play a role here in the context of rotation. And then the first portion of this particular video was seeing how chapter seven um, plays a role in our chapter 10 understanding.
So the next thing we need to do then is to revisit chapter 8. Uh, so if we think about what chapter 8 was, it was thinking about momentum. Momentum is uh, mass times velocity. So mass, if we think about the rotational analog, the rotational analog of mass is the moment of inertia. Moment of inertia is kind of like our, um, our rotational equivalent of mass. And if we think about regular velocity, the rotational equivalent is angular velocity. So even before we skip to the answer, I want you to write down what you think angular momentum is going to look like. Instead of mass times velocity, what two things are we going to be multiplying together? All right, now hopefully we said I times omega, because I, the moment of inertia, is kind of our rotational mass. And omega, the angular speed, is kind of like our rotational velocity. The units actually work out to be the same um, as they were back in the linear momentum chapter. Um, <coughs> that's not true. I'm sorry about that. So the units are a little different than they were back in the momentum chapter. We have kilograms times meters squared per second. You don't really have to memorize that, but if we think about what goes into moment of inertia and what goes into angular speed, then that's what the units work out to be. There's no fancy name for that. Um, in the same way, there wasn't really a fancy name for the linear momentum uh, units. It's also worth noting that angular momentum uses the capital letter L. Um, that's just what physics uses for angular momentum. And so we will see that in the textbook and in other resources, uh, and we just want to make sure we recognize what it's trying to tell us. The other thing that we had back in Chapter 8 was that we could change an object's momentum by pushing or pulling on it. That the net force times the elapsed time was this idea of impulse, but that caused a change in angular momentum. So again, we can think about our rotational analogs. Instead of force, the rotational equivalent of force is torque. Time stays time. And so a torque times the elapsed time creates a change in angular momentum. So we have the same overall structure of the idea from chapter 8, but now we're using the rotational analogs. So torque instead of force moment of inertia i instead of mass, and angular velocity omega instead of regular velocity. The other interesting thing, though, in chapter um, 10 here is that we can have the moment of inertia be different at the end of the problem compared to the start. In chapter 8, we really did not have the mass changing beyond our short discussion of rockets as a concept. But it's very easy to have the moment of inertia of an object change in a problem if that object simply changes its shape or overall size. There's a Cliff Divers video that will be in the, um, in the playlist. It's also uh, the bold words here are a clickable link in the posted slides. And so that gives us a sense of how we can change our moment of inertia. If there is no net external torque on the system, if nobody is causing rotation by pushing or pulling on a system, we can still think about how the angular momentum, I times omega, changes from the beginning to the end of the problem. We call this equation and the um, situations that we can use it for the conservation of angular momentum. Back in chapter 8, the only time that we really cared about the conservation of momentum was with collisions. Here in chapter 10, because an object can change its shape at, during a problem, we can actually have a lot of different situations where there's no collision at all that is able to conserve angular momentum. A figure skaters are a really common example of this. Again, there will be a video in the playlist as well as a clickable link here, the bolded words in the posted slides. It's one of the most common examples that there is. In addition, if you have a spinny chair um, at your uh, home or apartment, you can um, spin around in it with your arms fully outstretched. And then if you bring your arms inwards, you spin faster. That is actually visibly feeling this conservation of angular momentum idea. By bringing in your arms in your spinny chair, or a figure skater's arms um, 
while skating, you lower your moment of inertia, which allows you to increase your angular velocity without anybody applying an external torque on you. So kind of a cool idea. So this is going to have a fully worked example to see how these ideas play out um, in chapter 10. So we will have somebody who walks towards the center of a merry-go-round. And although the two links in the bottom right of this slide aren't in the playlist, you're welcome to click on them um, and explore those in the posted slides as well. So we will see how conservation of angular momentum can be used in problem solving, and we'll look at the rotational kinetic energy and talk about that in the example video for this one. The last couple of ideas that I want us to think about. So first of all, if an isolated system is not rotating, so imagine some object that isn't moving isn't rotating. An isolated system means nobody's going to push on it, there's not going to be this external torque, does it mean that that object can never rotate? So I want you to pause the video and think about it, or at the very least, just think about an object that might be able to start rotating without anybody pushing or pulling on it, or pushing or pulling itself on anything. And two of the best examples that we can think about um, are astronauts, because that's always something kind of cool to watch. And you can click this link if you're interested. It won't be in the playlist, but you can certainly um, check it out in the posted slides, where in um, the International Space Station or Space Lab or anywhere where we had astronauts that had space to move around, you can actually see um, rotation. If you swing your arms in one direction, your body rotates in the other direction. I don't know about you, but I have never been to space. But we can actually have a different situation that you may have experienced. Any time that you've ever done somersaults in a swimming pool underwater, so you swing your arms in one direction and your body rotates in the other direction, it's, it's going through this same phenomenon. Your arms have angular momentum in one sense, clockwise or counterclockwise, and your body has angular momentum in the opposite sense, counterclockwise or clockwise. So kind of a cool idea. You can look up um, somersault, uh, somersault records, like underwater somersault records on uh, the internet too to see this in action. Okay, so last two slides. One thing we want to make clear is that there is additional stuff in this chapter that we just don't have time for in our semester. Not only because we're online instead of on campus, but because we don't normally get to do these last couple of topics in great detail. Angular momentum is absolutely conserved in collisions. And our book goes into um, details of what that looks like, has example problems that can be done. And it's possible for us to do those with our toolkit. We just don't have the time to practice them to the level we would want if we're then gonna ask about them on a quiz or an exam. So we can think about a quick concept, though, that at least helps us imagine what's going on here. So our textbook makes some comments about um, tennis rackets, things like that. And we can see this same kind of thing in action with really any, um, any stick that we have available. In class, I normally have a full meter stick. I don't really have something that I can have on screen easily, um, but we can, we can still try. So I've got this pen here, okay? The center of mass is roughly at the center of the pen. And if I hit the pen with um, my hand on the top half while letting go, because I'm just gonna let go um, as I hit it, what should happen if I hit it um, at the top? So pause the video if you need to think through it. Um, but hopefully what we think is that it's gonna rotate and if I hit it, oh. <laughs> if I hit it on top, then it rotates in one direction. And if I hit it on the bottom, should it rotate in the same direction or the opposite direction? So think about that. If I hit it on the top, it rotated this way. What should happen if I hit it on the bottom? Okay. We see it rotate the opposite direction. So with those two quick um, senses, we can see that collisions 
Even my hand wasn't rotating to begin with. Collisions can cause rotation. And angular momentum is conserved at the beginning and end of the problem. It's just conserved with a um, off-center term, MVR, that we aren't even going to introduce the equation for in our slides. The last thing, though, if I hit the stick right at the center, what should happen um, to it when I do that instead of hitting it on the top or the bottom? So pause the video if you need to think through. Okay. If I hit at the center, then it just goes sideways. It doesn't really rotate one way or the other. It just moves sideways as it falls. And so we only have rotation if we hit it off center. And you're welcome to read this part of the textbook in more detail if you're interested in pursuing that idea. It's just not something that we, that we study. Another term that, um, or another topic that we won't get a chance to talk about in our lecture videos for this um, chapter is the idea of um, precession and how vectors actually work with angular uh, momentum and torque and things like that. We've been using clockwise and counterclockwise to define our directions, but that isn't what um, full-fledged physicists would be using. Um, they would be using a particular single direction in space based on what's called the right-hand rule. And so you're welcome to read through that in section 10.7. We're just not going to cover it in this semester. So I will see you in the example videos.